Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm not sure where you're joining us from or what time it is there, but we're going to worship the Lord. And this is our call to worship from Psalm 1. Come, let us delight in the law of the Lord. Our joy is found in the love of God and neighbor. Come, let us be nourished by the living water. Together, we will worship the one who enables us to thrive.
Hey, welcome. It's so good to see you guys. We are glad you have chosen to join us this morning, whether that be at home by yourself or with your family, wherever you're at. We're thankful for the chance to do church together with the wonders of technology. So thanks for joining us. Uh, we still have things going on around the church. Uh, if you need to take care of business at the church, the office continues to be open Monday through Thursday, 9 to 4 p.m. And one of the things that you might need to take care of this week is if you are a member of our church, we are holding our yearly elections for the board. And so uh, with things being different around here, you, uh, the elections are a little different as well. So throughout this week, in order to vote, you can do so uh, in these ways. You can uh, email Bertie in the church office uh, your choices for the board. You can mail them in, or you could also come in and actually fill out a ballot in the church office, again, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 4 p.m. Uh, we'd encourage you to still vote for your board members that you would desire. Um, we also would say that we understand that times are difficult right now for everybody with unexpected, the unexpectedness of this time, and even financially we understand it's difficult. And we just want to say thank you for your continued faithfulness as you support the church. Uh, we are doing everything we can to be responsible with your tithes and offerings, um, but we also appreciate if you are able to at this time to continue with your tithe faithfully. You can do so by either mailing it into the church office, or you can also go online to salemnaz.org, and there's a Give tab and you can give uh, electronically. So uh, let's pray before we continue worshiping with more songs. Lord, it is just good to be able to worship through, through a different means today, Lord. And wherever we're at, wherever we're gathered, Lord, I pray that you would just be present and bless us, Lord. Um, thank you that you are here no matter what life throws at us, Lord. Just the chance to worship you and praise you is a glorious thing. Lord, we love you, and we just thank you for all the little ways you've blessed us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue worshiping through song now.
a place of commanded blessing where people in unity dwell. A place where anointing oil is flowing, where we live as one. You have called us to be a body. You have called us a spread. Join together in the bond of the Spirit unto the end. Father, we join with the prayer of Jesus. As you are, so let us be one. Join together in unity and purpose. All for the the Lord to speak and the Holy Spirit to shape us and change us.
Well, greetings to each of you on this Sabbath morning. It is my prayer and it is my hope that in the midst of this current reality of our global viral pandemic, that each of you are experiencing the following. One, I hope you're experiencing and pray that you're experiencing the assurance of God's presence, for he truly has promised to be with us. Secondly, I I trust that you're also experiencing the gift of his sustaining grace. I'm reminded in scripture, and I would remind you that God's grace truly is sufficient for all of our needs. Thirdly, I, I would pray that you're also experiencing the strength of his Holy Spirit. For as our need is, his word assures us, so shall our strength be through his spirit living within us. And lastly, undergirding all of this, I pray that you are experiencing the reality that he is in the midst of this storm, still the almighty God, who is the creator of all things and is able to keep all who trust in him. It is he that is Lord, not the coronavirus. So the psalmist king, King David, I think, expresses it best in his beloved psalm when he wrote these words. Even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will fear no evil, for you, Lord, are with me. May that be true for each of us in these days. And so today's good news is this, wherever you are, Whatever your circumstances, God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're facing, and he is ready and available to walk with you and bring to you the comfort and the hope that will sustain you in this dark hour. Today's good news story to live by takes us to the good news of Jesus' life and teaching and his ministry and his mission of seeking and saving those who are lost and away from God, bringing them back into a right relationship with him uh, in order for they, us to experience how God created us to experience life. This story is recorded by Matthew. It's one of Jesus' uh, stories that, like that story of last week, has become one of his best-known parable stories. The setting is this. Jesus had been teaching and ministering throughout the area of northern Israel. Uh, We would know it as the land of Judah, uh, up in the northern regions around the Lake of Galilee, uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, He had been baptized by John, and from that moment on, as Jesus began his ministry, he began to draw a crowd. They were amazed by his teaching. They would say, we've never heard any teacher, any rabbi speak like this. And his ministry, therefore, immediately began to attract a following. Not only that, his miracles that he was performing became front page news. Wherever he went, there were those who were coming that they too might experience the anointed touch of this one who was able to to not only cast out demons, open blind eyes, open ears that had been deaf, or bring other healings, but even had the power to bring back from those who had been dead to life. So Jesus was obviously gathering a crowd wherever he went. He had been doing this, but he had also been encountering along the way a backlash from the religious authorities. Matthew 12 spotlights where this begins to come to a real head as Jesus had been teaching about what it meant to be a part of God's kingdom people. With that, the religious experts, those who consider themselves the experts of the law, they were quite disturbed by Jesus' behavior, let alone his teaching, for on this occasion... Jesus and his disciples had been walking through the grain field, probably on their way to the synagogue, if we read through Matthew 12, which sets the story for, uh, set for the story. Uh, the disciples, being hungry, pluck a few heads of the grain, and they begin to eat the seeds. Immediately, the 
Pharisees that were part of the crowd looking to see what Jesus was going to do or hear what he was going to say immediately spoke up saying, what do you think you're doing? This is the Sabbath. It is forbidden to work on the Sabbath. Jesus, what do you have to say about this? To that, Jesus replied, the Sabbath wasn't created, our man wasn't created for the Sabbath, but rather the Sabbath was created for man. Well, they were not happy with that response. And so as they go on into the synagogue, Jesus is confronted by a man who is a part of the congregation with what the Bible describes as a withered hand. The Pharisees focus in, what is Jesus going to do now? In the midst of all of this, Jesus sees the man, knows the need, and simply says, stretch out your hand. As he does, his withered hand is suddenly now made whole by the act of God's healing power through his son, Jesus Christ. Immediately, the Pharisees now, not only incensed by the fact that the disciples had dared to harvest grain on the Sabbath, Jesus is now healing on the Sabbath. Immediately, they challenged Jesus, by what authority do you set aside the Torah, the law of Moses, that the Sabbath is to be kept holy? Jesus reminds them, it is indeed permissible to do good and to bring healing, even on the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees are beside themselves. They are ready to try and find any way they can, not only to bring judgment against Jesus, but even to take his life if they could. With that, Jesus leaves the synagogue, moves to a house setting, again the crowd still continuing to follow him, and begins to teach them. It becomes so large that Jesus has to move from the house into an outside setting, taking them down by the lakeside. And there the crowd gathers as Jesus steps into a boat, moves a few feet away from the shore. It becomes a natural amphitheater. The winds coming off of the lake become a, a, a God-anointed sound system that takes the words of Jesus literally to the multitude of people that had gathered to hear him. With that, we get into this setting of this story, the story to live by, which is known as the sower and the seed. Matthew records it this way in chapter 13. The same day that Jesus went out of the house, he went down and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered about him that he got into a boat. And he sat in it, and while the people stood or sat upon the shore, then Jesus began to speak to them many things in these parables. First, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some of the seed fell on the path that was hardened by the footprints of those who had been beating down upon the earth. And the birds would come, and they would quickly take the seed and eat it. Some of the seed fell where there were a rocky shelf or rocky places. It immediately would take root and spring up, but because the soil was shallow and didn't have any depth, when the sun came up and the scorching heat of the sun was so great, the plants would then wither because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, and it too would grow. And as it grew, along with this plant, also the weeds were growing, until they became so great that they began to choke off the life of the plant. Still, Jesus said, some of the seed fell on good soil, and there it took root and it flourished, and it produced a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, greater than that which had been sown. And then Jesus closes this parable story by saying, whoever has ears to hear, then let them hear. The disciples came and asked, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to everyone. Whoever has 
a willing desire to hear will hear. Whoever does not will not understand. Then Jesus goes on in one of the few parables he explains, and you can continue reading that, but I want us to move into this parable that Jesus has now shared with those that had gathered on the lakeside perhaps that afternoon. A parable by definition is a story that that brings two things alongside in contrast, comparing them in order to convey a message. A simple definition, an old definition of a parable is explained it this way. A parable is simply an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. So today's story to live by, like last week's story of the Good Samaritan, is one of Jesus' best known stories. And so we find three main components of this story. As we found three main components are four in last week's story. There is first of all the sower, or the farmer. Then there is secondly the seed that is being sown. And thirdly, there is the variety of soils that Jesus denotes according to their constituency. First of all, the farmer or the sower is obviously Jesus. He's referring to himself as God's gift. He is the one who is coming bringing the good news, which is the seed that is to be sown among the people. Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God is now among them. The good news of God's intervening grace is now at work in God's plan of restoration for Israel, and not just Israel, but for all of creation is now underway and is taking shape and is happening even in their very midst. But not everybody is receiving the message and that it becomes the central focus of the story. So let's unpack it. The first thing we want to note is the grace of the sower. Back in Jesus' day, a sower, a farmer, knew that seed was very precious. It was hard to come by. You just couldn't run down to the local agricultural store and buy a bag of seed. It had to be saved from last year's harvest and kept very carefully so that it would be able to be sown in the time of sowing the next season. And so you didn't just indiscriminately throw seed where you knew that it was not going to produce a crop. But here Jesus in his story uses the illustration of a sower who's just throwing the seed out wherever it landed. It didn't matter. He was graciously sowing the seed. It tells us that Jesus was basically saying that Jesus came as God's true gift of His grace and of His love and of His forgiveness and of His mercy for all. You see, there were no elect ones in God's eyes. Contrary to what Israel thought that they were the chosen ones. God's chosen ones, according to what Jesus would share in John's Gospel that we know so well, that verse, John 3.16, where Jesus, in speaking to Nicodemus, says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life, and that God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be redeemed back to its place of being good in the eyes of God. Second Peter also reminds us in Peter's letter as he's writing to the church, wondering about all the things that were happening in their time, the persecution that was going on, and all the heartaches that they were facing, endeavoring to live their lives as a people of God in a world that was Every bit is in much of a topsy-turvy as our world is today with the pandemic of the coronavirus. Jesus was, uh, the Holy Spirit was speaking through Peter and he penned the words reminding them that God was patient in his return and they were wondering, when is he going to come? When is Jesus going to come back and, and take us away from all this heartache, from all this trouble, from all this persecution? from all the illnesses that we're facing, Peter reminds them, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some would understand slowness. Instead, 
He is patient with you, for God's desire is not for anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. This might be a prayer that we would want to be praying. I trust it is a prayer that we're praying in these days that we find ourselves facing a global pandemic where we begin to ask as God's people for God's grace to be revealed to a world that has seemingly forgotten Him. May it be through this that our eyes are once again reawakened to the grace of God that desires to redeem us and bring us back to Himself. But this was the good news. This was the, the grace of God being revealed through Jesus. It shows us the grace of the sower. The second thing that the story reveals for us is the reality of the soil. And here's where we move into the heart of the, of the parable. For Jesus was now saying that I've come and I've been sharing the good news and I've been teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God and, and, and all the dynamics of what God requires, His commandments, and how they're to be lived out in our day-to-day -day routine of living. But along with that, Jesus was also doing miracles and people were amazed at how that Jesus was touching their lives, going beyond what the religious norm of his day, daring to speak to those who were considered to be the outcasts, daring to reach out and embrace those who were on the peripheral edges of society saying that everybody is important in his kingdom. And yet, with all of that, Jesus says, these are the four responses that are being given. First, there was the hard soil, the hard packed earth, which was common, the footpaths that would be used between little plots of ground that sectioned themselves off. In Jesus' day, they didn't farm massive acres like we do today. They didn't have the means to do that. So their tracts of land were very small, not even perhaps a half acre in size. Between those half acres would be the walkways where the animals and where the, the people would walk. And so it became very hard packed uh, soil. And uh, if some of the seed would be sown on that, it would just lay there. And the birds would indeed come and quickly take the seed and, and eat it and consume it so that it would not have an opportunity to take root. And Jesus was saying there are some that are hearing there are some that are there even around the lake that day. They were there out of curiosity perhaps, but they weren't really listening. They were refusing to hear what Jesus had to say. He was an interesting speaker, but in no way were they allowing his words to penetrate into their heart. No way were they allowing his words of the kingdom of God to come in and invade their thinking or their lifestyle. You see, they didn't see a need for Jesus' message. They had no awareness of the danger of an eternity without God's grace and love at place in their lives. They were centrally focused on one thing and one thing only, and that was their own life, their own way, thinking in their own mind, believing the lie of the enemy all the way back into Genesis 1, where they thought, I'm my own God. I can set my own fate. I can determine my own destiny. I answer to nobody but me. And there are those who today, maybe even some that might be tuning in to this message, that somehow have bought into that same manner of thinking. We're not listening. We're not really hearing. We're not allowing God's Word to really penetrate into our lives. And then there was the rocky soil that Jesus refers to. Really wasn't necessarily a, a field with rocks as much as it was. Perhaps a, a rock shelf more likely was underneath the soil. And so the soil was very thin it, on the crust of it all. It had no depth. And while the seed would would germinate, it, it had no ability to, to set down deep roots. And so when the sun would rise in its heat of the, of the midday and the scorching heat would come as the plant was, was endeavoring to grow and to produce, it would, it would wither, it would burn. 
And so Jesus was really saying, there's some of you that are going to be like that. You're going to hear my word and you're going to be so excited and you're ready to join in and you're saying, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Jesus, I'm one of your disciples. I believe in what you're saying. And yet, in their eagerness to respond, when things begin to get difficult and when they begin to realize the demands of living God's kingdom lifestyle encroaches on their desires or their wishes, or maybe they find themselves facing some persecution. Maybe they find themselves having to be questioned by the religious right of their day as to how could they believe and follow this rabbi that dares to go against their interpretation of the Torah law. They quickly fade away. I'm reminded of a story that uh, comes out of China back in the days of the communist regime when uh, the church was underground, and it still is much today there in China. But the story is told of of a house church where they were having uh, an evening meeting, and they would slip in one at a time very quietly and, and try to be as unnoticed as they could thinking that they could gather together as a small group of people in this house church and pray and share God's Word together and encourage one another in the faith. They had been doing this for weeks in their small village out in the back country, thinking that the communist guards would not have noticed that they were doing this. But in the middle of the night, as they had come in, in that hour, an unlikely hour for anybody to gather, and they had found themselves sitting together in the, in, in the house and they begin to, to sing quietly their, their songs of praise and, and begin to share how God had blessed them. Suddenly, the door was crashed open and immediately coming in were three soldiers with their, with their weapons focused upon them. And the soldiers in gruff voices says, so you're here meeting as God's people. Any of you that really claimed not, don't want to be persecuted, any of you that are willing to give your life up uh, and not willing to give your life up, uh, you can leave now immediately. And with that, two or three, maybe four or five of the people kind of stood and slipped out and seeing this as a moment and knowing that the next sound they were going to hear would be the firing of the rifles into the mass that still remained. And as those ones slipped out into the night, the guards then shut the door. And then they said, we too are believers, but we know not everybody that comes in is. We're willing to give our lives as you are for Jesus. Such is the rocky soil. It challenges us not only to be a believer, but to let God's Word truly penetrate in our life. It's not an outer garment that we put on. It must truly transform us. Then there are the weeds, the soil that uh, had the weeds. It gets so caught up in, in the distractions of, of life, the busyness of, of making money or, or gaining fame or gaining fortune or doing these other things that we allow busyness, not bad things necessarily, but just busyness, to take over, and it pushes the Word of God out of our lives. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time to worship. We don't have time to read the Word of God. We don't have time to allow God to come in and, and truly make the transforming difference that He desires to make in our lives. And so busyness crowds out God's business, for God wants to transform us. And then there's the productive soil. The soil that takes root and, and it allows the power of the seed. And that's the third point. The power of the seed is the good news and it has the ability to transform our lives and to change us. God doesn't want to just clean us up on the outside. He wants to transform us inside so that we truly do become productive. The choice of the soil is yours. Probably at some point, every one of us could say there was a time when I didn't take time to hear. I ignored God's Word. Some can say, yes, that was me. I jumped in immediately and I was ready to go all out for Jesus until 
I found what that going all out meant. Or some would find themselves saying, yes, I've allowed distractions to come. Worry, fear, all these other things to, to crowd out my desire to, to live as God wants me to live. There are some that are being productive. You're a disciple and you're making disciples. Jesus' challenge is every one of us, every one of us has the ability to be a productive believer in His kingdom work. And in today's pandemic, this world needs productive disciples. Men and women, young people of faith that are willing to live their lives in a way that allows Jesus to transform them to work through their stories, to work through their acts of love and kindness and compassion to a needy world, and thus be Jesus' messengers, that He is truly the hope we need. So my prayer for you is this. May the grace, the peace, the mercy, and the power of the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and throughout this season of unrest in our world. And may you be a productive change agent for Jesus' sake. And may you bring forth fruit for his kingdom. Lives changed and transformed because you dared to let the word of God take root in your life and share it with others. God bless you. And may his peace and grace be yours. God, have a blessed day.